You are listening to Unsavory, where true crime meets food. Welcome, everyone. You're listening to Unsavory. I'm Becca. And I'm Sarah. Are you used to saying Unsavory yet? Uh, no. (laughs) Yeah, I know. Me either. It still sounds weird. But I love it. But it still sounds weird. In my head, I still call it dad. I know, me too. So I'm going to be a, yeah, <laughs> a long phase out. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So this is exciting. This is our official Thanksgiving episode. Mm-hmm. Canadian Thanksgiving. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving to all of our Canadian listeners. All of our Canadian friends. Do you have any Thanksgiving plans, Becca? I think we're going to do a Thanksgiving paella with the in-laws. Oh, paella. That's nice. Non-traditional. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Delish. That's about it. How about you? Uh, just food-related plans, too. Dinner. But ours will be more, like, traditional, like turkey and pie and all the goods. Stuffing. Stuffing's my favorite. Stuffing is good. How do you feel about turkey? It's not my favorite meat. Like, mm-hmm. I eat it once a year. It's dry. It is dry. I just, I just don't love it. But it's, I don't know, part of Thanksgiving, so. Yeah. And I love a turkey sandwich. Oh, yeah. With cranberry yeah. sauce and a little bit of gravy. And like stuffing and mashed potatoes like on the sandwich. On the sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> just everything. You should just make the stuffing back into a piece of bread. Oh my gosh. Genius. <laughs> With a waffle maker. Yes. <gasps> that must exist. If not. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm looking this up right now. Stuffing. I'm certain that exists. It's genius. Stuffing waffles. They do exist. Yeah. Wow. Okay. We have to try these and put them on our Instagram. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Sounds amazing. What were you going to say? Two years ago, something happened? Oh, two years ago, I actually transitioned from turkey to just doing like roast chickens instead. Yeah. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it more. Yeah, I think that's that's definitely a good call. Mm-hmm. Anyways, do we have an episode for you guys today? Sarah is going to first share a bit about germ theory, and then I'm going to tell you about one of its most notable defiance, and that is <laughs> Miss Mary Mallon, aka Typhoid Mary. Typhoid Mary. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know those stories I love that her. just like stick with you? Mm-hmm. This is one of those for me. I'm obsessed with this story and I feel like it really just has all of the elements that you need and that's like historical references, it has disease, food, and one very devious woman. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) A historical badass woman who is also a criminal, but like not intentionally. It's so cool. I love this story. I love this story. Let's not give too much away here. (laughs) I know. Okay. Let's just dive right in. The information in this podcast is for entertainment and educational purposes only. If you're interested in medical nutrition therapy or personalized nutrition advice, please talk to a physician or registered dietitian in your area. If you have a history of disordered eating, be advised that nutrition details will be discussed and take the steps you need to protect your recovery journey. All the citations and relevant links for anything mentioned in this episode will be in our show notes on our website, unsavorypodcast.com. This podcast may contain coarse language, mature subject matter, and content of a violent or disturbing nature. Listener discretion is advised. This is an independently produced podcast. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can sign up as a donor through the Patreon link in our bio. If you could rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends, that would really help us out, and we will be forever grateful. Okay, so... At the intersection of true crime and food, it's pretty natural that food poisoning would come up frequently. And so Becca and I have talked a lot about food poisoning on Unsavory before. Mm -hmm. We've talked about, Becca, your personal experiences (laughs) with food poisoning. and So many. And we also covered the Peanut Corporation of America peanut butter salmonella outbreak that killed nine people. Um, And there are many, many other mass food poisonings that we could and probably will cover one day on the pod. And even yesterday, I shared on our Instagram, I don't know if you saw it, but Mm -hmm. there are over 400 people currently sick in the United States right now with a salmonella outbreak of unknown origin. Yeah, that's Texas, right? Mainly Texas? Mostly Texas, yeah. It's really too bad. With all the food poisoning talk that we've done in the past, I think most of our listeners probably already know that food poisoning is caused by some sort of contamination, most often biological contamination from 
humans, rodents, or microorganisms, and it's caused by bacteria, viruses, or parasites transferred through saliva, blood, feces, and inadequate hygiene practices. But normally feces. Normally feces. I know. It's so gross. (laughs) That was the Peanut Corporation of America one. Food poisoning is still very, very common. So it's actually decreased since COVID-19 due to all the different like hygiene, safety measures, social distancing, things like that, which is cool. But it is still very, very common. So the World Health Organization estimates that one in 10 people get sick and about half a million will lose their lives to food poisoning each year. Wow. So clearly, food poisoning is still a huge public health concern. But it's pretty incredible to think about how far food safety practices have come since the late 1800s. Only 150 years ago, people actually thought of wine and beer as hygienic or safe beverages because they protected them from waterborne diseases, which is kind of cool. Is that not true? No, it's true. Yeah, okay. (laughs) It was true. Like, that was considered more healthy and safe than water. Yeah, it is wild. Pretty shocking. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the evolution of food safety. Up until the mid-1800s, people didn't know what germs were. They didn't know about viruses and bacteria. They didn't know why maggots would show up on dead bodies. And they didn't know why food would spoil or why wine would turn into vinegar. And it's interesting to think about because... Now we know all about germs and how they're spread, but people really had no idea of that whole concept. So throughout history, people have blamed all sorts of things for causing disease. Demons, ghosts, evil spirits, sins, spiritual blockages, and even bad smells. And there was even a theory of spontaneous generation, which claimed that some life forms like rats, maggots, and flies could arise spontaneously under certain circumstances. But one of the biggest theories that lasted from the time of ancient Greece up until the mid-19th century was called the miasma theory. Have you heard of that? Um, No. This theory proposed that all illnesses, from the common cold to cholera and malaria, came from clouds of dirty air called miasma. And this theory was first proposed by Hippocrates around 400 BC, and he wrote that poisonous vapors or bad air was the root cause of disease. And I actually, like, it makes logical sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of diseases are airborne, and a common symptom of being sick is coughing. And then plus, if you think of, like, sickness and death and dying, there are a lot of smells. Right. So I see the logic. I see how it made sense. And there is an ounce of truth there. Like some diseases are airborne. And the miasma theory was supported by medical scientists up until about the 1900s, so the late 1800s. But it wasn't understood that there were microorganisms actually being transported through the air. And just a fun fact, malaria actually gets its name from this theory. So in Italian, mal means bad and area means air. Malaria, bad air, miasma. Hmm. But of course, now we know malaria is caused by a parasite that infects mosquitoes and has nothing to do with bad air. Okay, so I hadn't heard of the name miasma before, but in my research, it did talk a little bit about um, like typhoid and other diseases being transferred Mm -hmm. like through the smell of sewage and stuff like that. But then there was also some information on filth theory, which I feel like... Filth theory? I didn't even hear about that. I'll I'll touch on shortly. Soon. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Perfect. Okay, speaking of bad smells. Mm -hmm. In the mid-1800s in England, there was a severe cholera outbreak that was ravaging the densely populated working-class neighborhoods of London. And this is the outbreak that really started to transition the prevailing paradigm from miasma theory to germ theory. So at the start of the cholera outbreak, people were actually taking many precautions to avoid bad air, because that was the leading theory. So they would avoid areas with an outbreak to prevent getting cholera. And a little bit about cholera, it's a waterborne disease that causes diarrhea mostly, 
And there was a cholera pandemic that ravaged the world from 1846 to 1860 and killed millions across the globe. So Europe, the Americas, Asia, everywhere was affected. It was particularly bad in India and Russia, and it was pretty much everywhere. But the year 1853 to 1854 was particularly tough on London, England, and over 23,000 people died. And there was one particular hotspot on Broad Street. Okay, so one medical scientist named Jon Snow. Did you watch Game of Thrones? No. I know you didn't. I, I just, <laughs> I think we, we talked about this recently, but Jon Snow is like one of my ultimate TV crushes. He's a huge character in Game of Thrones. He's so handsome. I just, I'm Googling him right now. Oh my I gosh. Cute. Anyways, he's like... <laughs> He, and he's also the hero and the good guy. And like, oh, just the name Jon Snow makes me love this scientist so much. <laughs> so there's one scientist named Jon Snow, and he had this theory that cholera was not spread by bad air, but instead through water and food. And he proposed that there actually was a germ involved. So Jon Snow went on to conduct a study, and he actually identified the source of the outbreak as a popular public water pump in the Broad Street neighborhood. And then he mapped out all the cholera outbreaks in the area and illustrated that there was a clear connection between water quality at the water pumps and cholera outbreaks. And his work would eventually be seen as a major event in the history of public health. And I say eventually because this groundbreaking work was largely brushed to the side at the time. So a leading epidemiologist, William Farr, rejected Jon Snow's hypothesis, and in his annual report, he stated that cholera was caused by miasma, as evidenced by an inverse relationship between cholera mortality and elevation above sea level. So basically, as you increased your elevation above sea level, maybe by living on a hill or a mountain, your risk of dying from cholera went down. And... Mm. I would say that's probably because you're less likely to be living in a poor, densely populated working class area of the city, and you probably have access to cleaner water. And maybe Mr. Farr hadn't heard that correlation does not equal causation. <laughs> but that was what he wrote at the time, and it confirmed the public's belief that bad air was causing cholera. A little bit of a setback there, eh? A little bit of a setback. They were so close. So Jon Snow's work was kind of brushed off because the leading theory in medical science at the time was the miasma theory. And I want to make a quick detour here to explain what theory means in science, because in casual conversation, theory is usually used just to describe a hunch or a guess, something that's not really based off of evidence, but maybe just like an observation or a feeling, like I have a theory, blah, 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 blah. But in science, a theory refers to a well-substantiated explanation of an aspect of the natural world that can incorporate laws, hypotheses, and facts. So it's not just a hunch. There really is, you know, consistent evidence to support a theory, and a theory can be used and applied to explain different phenomenons. So when I say that miasma theory was the leading theory at the time, it wasn't just a hunch. It was really the, the scientifically accepted best explanation of disease transfer at the time. And there were other theories, but this was the leading one. So I wanted to make that distinction because I think it sets the stage really well for your story, Becca, where you see how resistant people can be to a new theory mm -hmm. if they're like taking... Like, just imagine if the theories that we accept, like germ theory or the theory of evolution or like cell theory, these really well-established theories, something came along and they were like, that's not the theory anymore. It would like rock your whole world. Yeah. Our round world. <laughs> Our very round world. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's a great example. Okay. So back to the cholera outbreak. Jon Snow is a total hero. No one is listening. And around the same time, some scientists are starting to pay attention to this new theory called germ theory. But there isn't a lot of evidence to support it yet. So let's bring it back to food. Around the exact same time as this cholera pandemic, 
a 33-year-old French scientist named Louis Pasteur, was being recruited to help France solve a problem that they were having with alcohol. So Louis Pasteur was born in 1822 in France, and by the time he was 33, he was already a decorated scientist. Only 33. Must be nice. <laughs> he probably didn't have a podcast, though. Yeah. We have two years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So he had done a bunch of work in crystallography. He actually concluded that the asymmetry of molecules was a defining characteristic of life. And he had even started working on medical developments, such as creating a more stable form of quinine to treat fevers. And around this time, he was approached, this is like 1856, so cholera epidemic still going on, pandemic, I should say. And he was approached by a local manufacturer of beetroot alcohol and recruited to help figure out why this alcohol was going sour. So Pasteur began looking at yeast under the microscope, and people were well aware of the importance of yeast in creating alcohol, but they didn't really know what it was. So Pasteur actually realized that yeast was a living organism and that it was responsible for the fermentation process. And he then looked at a spoiled sample of alcohol that had gone sour and realized that there was an additional rod-shaped organism in the sour alcohol called Mysoderma aceti. Aceti? Not sure. But that's the name for the bacteria that creates vinegar, basically. It's called the mother of vinegar. Okay. So he discovered that. And then the president of France at the time, Emperor Napoleon III, recruited Pasteur to continue studying these diseases of wine and this is where Pasteur discovered that microbes were causing the spoilage and that heating the wine would kill the microbes that caused it to spoil. So he continued to experiment for a long time on all sorts of different wines, and he found the exact time and temperature required to kill the harmful bacteria without actually changing the taste of wine. So I bet he drank a lot of oh, wine yeah. uh, <laughs> during the testing phases. <laughs> Okay, so it's through those wine experiments that Louis Pasteur invented pasteurization. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, so pasteurization is still used today, and it's saved countless lives from food and waterborne illness. Tuberculosis actually used to be commonly carried in milk, which I didn't know. But the pasteurization process kills the tuberculosis pathogen, and now there is a very low risk, little to no risk of getting tuberculosis from pasteurized milk. It's actually not even on the CDC's list of foodborne illnesses anymore. Yeah, typhoid as well, which we will discuss. There was a lot of thought around typhoid being transferred through milk as well. And I think that it probably stemmed from the idea of having tuberculosis in milk. Totally. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so the tuberculosis in milk was throughout the 1800s, known as the White Plague. Ooh, milky plague? So interesting. The Milky <laughs> Plague. Yeah, so pasteurization is actually a really incredible process because it can make milk safe without impacting nutrition. And the first commercial milk pasteurizers were produced in 1882, and the first law requiring the pasteurization of milk was in Chicago in 1908. Although at the time... And even up to today, there was a lot of resistance to pasteurizing milk. And there is the whole like raw milk movement, which I was going to get into into this in this intro. But I think we could save that for another whole episode. episode. Yeah, we could easily <laughs> yeah. cover that in an hour. <laughs> for sure. For sure. So I'm not going to comment on it here, but I do drink pasteurized milk. Same. <laughs> and one, <laughs> just got to get, get that in there. <laughs> And one thing that I found really interesting, and I know you're going to talk about this a little bit too, is that there's this public and political resistance to scientific breakthroughs, mm -hmm. like we're seeing now with the vaccine, is nothing new. It's been there forever. Mm -hmm. Do you remember even in the wine episode when they did, so in my intro, I talked about how they had the wine, the grape louse. And then they figured out how to stop it and do this tree transplant thing. And then everyone was like, no. And they were in two camps, people who embraced the innovation, the people who are traditionalists. And didn't they think that the scientists had planted the louse to make yes. money? 
<laughs> yes, to get the prize, which he didn't even have, end up getting. So uh, scandalous. Anyways, yeah, people have been resistant to science for ever and ever and ever. Okay, so Louis Pasteur's work was a pivotal moment for the development of the germ theory of disease because now there was documented proof and quality experimentation to show that there were actual microorganisms causing the spoilage. And Pasteur went on to apply his work to the world of medicine, and he actually invented the vaccine for chicken cholera, anthrax, and rabies. After Louis's work, another scientist named Robert Koch went on to expand on the germ theory of disease, and by the end of the 1880s, the miasma theory was basically busted. Koch actually is in my part as well. So just take note of that name. Nice. Spanner on germ theory. Yeah, he, was, he came up a lot. Okay, mm-hmm. cool. And by the 1890s, public health and medical science was fully transitioning to a generation of better hygiene to help prevent the spread of disease. And with that, <laughs> I'm going to toss it to you to talk all about hygiene <laughs> and disease. Yes. Okay, that was amazing, Sarah. I feel like I've always found cool? germ theory so interesting. I remember learning about it in undergrad, and it was like one of the only readings, like learning about the water systems and that stuff. you ever did. Not that I ever did, but that I ever enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's so cool. I also love the history of this stuff, Me too. like the history of science and the history of food. And oh, I'm a history buff. Who knew? Same. And okay, well, not a buff, a history. Someone who's interested in history. (laughs) I was in French immersion in elementary Mm -hmm. and high school, and all of my history classes were in French. So I feel like I have very little understanding of history because learning it in a different language and then just keeping it in your brain is kind of challenging. And learning about history now, I just feel like I can appreciate it more than I would have if I had learned about it in English way back when. But True. Also with age. With age. Like when you're a kid, you're like, it's so far in the past. For example, the public reaction to a scientific innovation. I'm like, that's not history. That's still happening. Yeah. It's just interesting. Also, if you learned history in French, was I saying pasteur, right? Pasteur. Yeah, that sounds right. (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. (laughs) Well done. But yeah, no, I just, yeah, just have such an appreciation for history now. And these stories that we cover that are more historic, I just get so lost in. But yeah, yours was the perfect segue into my part, like almost too perfect because our dates, I don't even know if they'll overlap, but I feel like I'm taking it off from where you left off. Amazing. I guess before we get started, I wanted to see if you remembered that song. It was probably came out when we were in undergrad in the like 2010s. It was called Dirty Mary. Yeah. It was a terrible, terrible song. It was like a club song. (laughs) Yes. But ever since I started doing this research, I've had it stuck in my head. Is it about her? So I went to go and look because I was like, there's no way this isn't about her. Like a song just called Dirty Mary. First off, the lyrics are vulgar, but listen to it later. (laughs) I will. But I can confirm that the lyrics and the song is not about her. It's about a different Mary. Okay. Um, But I'm just very excited to hopefully get the song out of my head once I'm done telling you the story. (laughs) Okay. So some of the key references that I used for this uh, include an amazing book by Anthony Bourdain. Oh, no way. And yeah. Yeah. Cool. It was really well written. And if you like this story, I would highly recommend giving it a read. There was a, a paper by Marinelli called Mary Mallon and the History of Typhoid Fever and the podcast, This Podcast Will Kill You, and their episode titled, Ooh. There's Something About Mary. That's such a good name. <laughs> and I listened just like to the first half of the episode where they describe like the epidemiology of typhoid. And again, I'd highly recommend this as well. Just give it a listen if you want to learn more about like the history and the onset of the disease because it's very thorough, way more thorough than... I'll be getting into. (laughs) Okay, so what exactly is typhoid? So typhoid or typhoid fever is a disease caused by the Salmonella typhi bacteria. It's often grouped under a category of enteric fevers with another disease called paratyphoid fever, which is very similar to regular typhoid, but is typically less intense with a shorter duration. 
Typhoid symptoms include fever, weakness, stomach pain, headache, diarrhea, or constipation, cough, loss of appetite, or a rash. So basically all of the most terrible symptoms. Yep. (laughs) In more severe and untreated cases, internal bleeding and death are possible. So without treatment, the instance of death, it was really, really high with a, a mortality between 10 and 30%. But with treatment, it's only 1%-ish, which still seems pretty high to me. But this infection can last anywhere from a few days to a few months. And it some can times get worse as it goes on. Aye. Which I mean, obviously with death and, and stuff like that, but I feel like if you have a disease or an infection, oftentimes you assume it will get better over time. Yeah. But this one actually can get really, really much Just more worse. Just progressively worse. Okay. Yes. Okay, so... Typhoid bacteria is most often spread through food or water, and the culprit is almost always poop. I saw that coming. <laughs> it's, oh, always, it's, it's always letters. It's always poo. poo. <laughs> so with food, it might be spread through unsanitary food handling practices, so like not washing your hands. And with water, contamination might occur if the waterways aren't properly disinfected prior to drinking. So kind of what you're covering. Because of this, it is often countries, cities, or areas without proper sanitation infrastructure that are affected by typhoid. So developing countries and lower income areas often suffer. And if we've learned anything from the water crisis in Flint, Michigan, or that of the rural indigenous communities in Canada, clean drinking water is still inaccessible to many in North America and, of course, across the globe as well. Unacceptable. It's so unacceptable. Mm -hmm. And even in a country where clean water is defined as a right in our charter, so that's Canada, like politics and racial segregation continue to play a huge role in the access and availability of this resource that we literally need to live. Yeah. It's disgusting. It's awful. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, typhoid specifically is more often found in parts of Asia, Africa, the Caribbean, Central and South America, as well as the Middle East. So the WHO estimates that there are about 21 million cases of typhoid each year and 222,000 associated deaths. And I know you had mentioned it was around half a million deaths due to Food food poisoning. And so I think that typhoid seems to be a huge contributor to that. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Mm hmm So the majority of these cases, though, they are predominantly in South Asia. So in Canada, there are only about 150 confirmed cases of typhoid each year. And in the U.S., that number is around 400 a year. But the actual numbers are likely much higher than this. They just go unreported. And um, most of these cases are reported by people who have recently traveled to areas around the world where typhoid is more rampant. The reason this disease is so nutritionally relevant is that it really impacts the digestive system. So after we consume the contaminated food or drink, the salmonella typhi bacteria begin to invade these little like lymph node type follicles in the ileum, so like the last part of our small intestine. And these are called um, Peyer's patches, so these little lymph node type things. Since these patches are a part of the lymphatic system, they play a really important role in our immune surveillance in our digestive tracts. Hmm. With most pathogens, the Peyer's patches will act as like that first line of defense. And they're full of like white blood cells, which are key players in the body's immune system. So white blood cells trigger inflammation to help fight off infection and protect the area. And there are two known disorders associated with Peyer's patch dysfunction. So both Crohn's disease and graft versus host disease, which is a condition that sometimes occurs after a stem cell transplant where the donor's stem cells attack the host's body. But both of these disorders result in digestive distress and sometimes inflammation in that area. Yeah, the GI system is so tightly linked to our immune system. It's really fascinating. Yeah. And just like thinking about these Pyrus patches is kind of like that first line of defense. Mm-hmm. Just little fighters. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A little patch army. Yeah. <laughs> 
Anyways, the salmonella typhi bacteria can live within our cells. And one of the first things that these bacteria do is they enter the white blood cells in those patches. So here they start to replicate and travel with the cells wherever they go. And this is how it moves out of our digestive tract. So how typhoid moves out of our digestive tract to the rest of our body. Um, So the bacteria attacks the sensor system that is designed to protect us, which is a super scary concept. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) So you know how I said that typhoid isn't very common in North America? Well, this hasn't always been the case. So prior to the germ theory and knowledge around public hygiene and sanitation, typhoid really had its way with people. I mean, it still does, but Mm -hmm. people in North America. So between 1607 and 1624, it was responsible for the deaths of over 6,000 English settlers in Jamestown, Virginia. And during war-torn times, typhoid fever really thrived, often killing more soldiers than combat itself. Wow. Mm -hmm. During the American Civil War in the late 1800s, the unsanitary living conditions led to typhoid, which took the lives of over 80,000 soldiers. War sucks. Yeah, war really does suck. But like way before the American Civil War, so in 430 BC, it's said that the plague of Athens was actually a result of typhoid fever as well. So this disease just really has a history. Wow. Same with cholera, actually. Like I talked about one cholera outbreak in my intro. In the past 200 years, there's been seven cholera pandemics. Like it was just crazy. I had no idea. Yeah, there's been a lot of pandemics, epidemics. Yeah. We it's think we're special. We're not. I know. <laughs> we're not that special. Yeah. But it is interesting to learn about them in hindsight now that we're also mm-hmm. currently in one. Yeah. So in 1872, a doctor named William Budd, he was able to demonstrate that typhoid was transmitted through human feces in drinking water. Okay. John Snow did it first. But was <laughs> it typhoid specific? That was cholera. <laughs> <laughs> okay. William Budd, he's all about Typhoid poo, okay? Okay, okay, (laughs) perfect. Despite the fact that many scientists contributed to the isolation of the bacterium, the genus Salmonella was named after an American pathologist and USDA research administrator, Daniel Elmer Salmon. Aw, So they kind of took his last name and his middle (laughs) name and put it kind of together. Salmon Elmer. Would you want a deadly bacteria named after you? If it was between a deadly bacteria and a school, I would choose a school. Okay. But deadly bacteria or nothing in your namesake, you'd go deadly bacteria. Yeah. Okay. Would you not? Um, I mean, salmonella kills a lot of people. <laughs> it does. I, yeah, I guess when you put it that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to think about it. Okay, maybe I changed my mind. I wasn't thinking about all of the deaths deaths associated with your name. (laughs) Um, So after the discovery of the microorganism, more knowledge was accumulated on typhoid and a vaccine was developed. So in 1896, it was approved for military use, which led to a huge improvement in the health of soldiers at war. And it was soon no longer a military problem. Hmm. So during World War I, the majority of soldiers were inoculated and more soldiers were killed by combat than disease, which was actually a good thing. Yeah, Yeah. sounds awful, but it's progress. (laughs) But yeah, just to put things in perspective, before the vaccine, typhoid would infect about 14,000 soldiers out of every 100,000. And then following the rollout of the vaccine, And during World War I, typhoid only killed 37 soldiers out of every 100,000. So you could say the vaccines work. At this point, you might be wondering how this relates to a lady by the name of Typhoid Mary. And I'm going to tell you right now. Mary Mallon, she was born in 1869 in Cookstown, Northern Ireland. She was tall, blonde, with blue eyes, and she was said to have like a really rigid jawline. So (laughs) she was a stern woman. (laughs) Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. She emigrated to the U.S. in 1883 to start a new life for herself, and she began picking up jobs cooking for wealthy families. The cook in a household at this time 
was actually seen as like the top of the hierarchy when it came to domestic service jobs because you had everybody kind of reporting into you and like buying groceries and serving the family the food that you had prepared. So they were really like the top of the pyramid. And Mary just, she really thrived in this role. So she was referred to as a pretty good cook, but tended <laughs> to be difficult to talk to. Okay. But she loved her job. <laughs> Not exactly a glowing review. <laughs> no. But her signature dish was this delicious homemade peach ice cream, which is an important detail to remember. Sounds amazing. It does right now. <laughs> From 1900 to 1906, Mary cooked for at least six families. And in 1906, she began working for Charles Henry Warren, who was a wealthy banker in New York City at the time. During the summers, the Warren family would summer in Oyster Bay, Long Island. And from August 27th to September 3rd that year, five of the 11 people living in the Warren home started to feel ill and presented with typhoid fever. This included Warren's two daughters, two maids, and the gardener. The family was initially too ashamed to report their illness, since typhoid was generally a disease that thrived in unsanitary or overcrowded living conditions. And the Warrens were extremely wealthy. They had five massive homes. And Charles, the dad, he was especially worried that if people caught wind of their family's illness, that nobody would want to rent the home, like their summer home during the next season. So he decided to hire a team of experts to prove that the disease had come from outside of the home. So local health authorities assessed the drinking water and all milk products since unpasteurized dairy was also a known source at the time of typhoid contamination. But the results from this investigation were inconclusive. Warren was not satisfied with this and he reached out to Dr. George Soper, who was a family friend and sanitary engineer. Wow, Soper is such a fitting last name mm -hmm. for a sanitary <laughs> engineer. So true. Dr. Soper was well known as a doctor to sick cities. And even though this was a bit of an unusual request for him, he immediately agreed to the job that the Warren family had presented. After reviewing the health authorities' findings, he began to interview all of the members of the home, as well as any visitors that had visited over the past 10 years. But he couldn't link the typhoid to anyone that the family had interacted with. His findings also suggested that the bacteria had not come from the water or the milk in the home like the health authorities had already established. So one thing that Dr. Soper uncovered was that earlier in August of that year, the Warrens had hired a new cook. What was even more suspicious was that she had since gone missing. <laughs> <laughs> she left three weeks following the family's initial typhoid diagnosis and no formal resignation or indication of where she was going. So this was the circumstantial evidence that Dr. Soper needed, and it was really his only evidence. So mm -hmm. at that point, he focused all of his efforts on Miss Mary Mallon. I just can't stop smiling. Like, I love this I story so much. I know. <laughs> <laughs> She's so devious. I I'm know. so conflicted. And just doesn't know. Okay. She, does she not know, though? Well, she doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Okay. <laughs> So Dr. Soper went to the employment agency that Mary used, and he was able to get his hands on her employment history from the past 10 years. He was really focused on these last 10 years. I don't know why. But he reached out to many of her previous employers, and you'll never guess what he found. 100% of the homes that she had worked in, there had been a typhoid outbreak. Oh, Mary. Oh, Mary. And I'm going to read you a quote from Soper's investigation. So following her trail backward to cases in 1904, I found she had worked at the home of Henry Gisley at Sand Point, Long Island, where four of seven servants suddenly got the disease. Going back still further, I found that five weeks after Mary had gone to cook at the summer home of Jay Coleman Drayton of Dark Harbor, Maine in 1902, seven out of nine persons in the house contracted typhoid. And so did a trained nurse and a woman who came to the house to work by the day. There had been an outbreak of the disease in New York in 1901, and I had reason to believe that Mary was behind this. In 1904, Tuxedo Park, the fashionable summer resort, was stricken, and I discovered she had cooked there in that time. 
That's a lot of coincidences. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. But there was still a two-year gap in Mary's employment timeline, and Dr. Soper had been on this case for over four months, and at this point, he was becoming a bit obsessed. Where was she those two years, and where was she hiding now? And I feel like the whole thing became very Catch Me If You Can, which is Mm. one of my favorite movies. Yeah, very good movie. What was then more commonly known as filth theory, which was the concept that disease came from filth, it had recently been replaced by germ theory, which, as you mentioned, Sarah, is the idea that disease is a result of microorganisms or pathogens that get into, like, food or water. So Dr. Soper laid out the evidence that he had. So the Warren's home was maintained and cleaned. There were no indications of contamination elsewhere. And even Mary Mallon was reported to have seemed healthy leading up to the typhoid outbreak. He started to wonder if it was possible that Mary had typhoid without being symptomatic. And that's when he made a scientific discovery. The very first asymptomatic carrier of disease in the United States. Being an asymptomatic carrier essentially means that you're infected with a pathogen, but you don't display any symptoms of the associated disease. I feel like Dr. Soper is such a good detective. Mm -hmm. Like the fact that even he, he put all these pieces together and then even still was thinking like, how could this be? It's pretty cool. Yeah. In Anthony Bourdain's book, they really talk about how it seemed like Dr. Soper really wanted to be a detective, even though he was kind of a nerdy scientist. Aw. But the whole thing I just love so much. That's awesome. Nerdy scientists are cool too. I can relate as a dietitian that wants to be a true crime podcaster. <laughs> <laughs> We're nerdy scientists, sort yeah. of. That sort can't of. pronounce any scientific names. And detectives, sort of. <laughs> this, is, this is a bit of a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> so there was one other case of a typhoid carrier in Germany, and Dr. Soper started to focus his research there. So another doctor and bacteriologist named Dr. Robert Koch, who you mentioned, he had studied a baker who was spreading the bacteria to bakery patrons, despite having no symptoms herself. This woman had previously had typhoid, but she had since fully recovered. And Dr. Koch obtained and tested a fecal sample and found that it was crawling with typhoid bacteria. So by not properly washing her hands after going to the bathroom, she was spreading the infection to people eating her baked goods. Ah, yep. Gross. (laughs) Gross to think about. So Dr. Soper's American scientific breakthrough made him more desperate to find Mary. He knew that this was going to make him hugely famous. And since this was the early 20th century, the fatality rate for typhoid was still over 10%. And these findings had the potential to save lives. After many more months of interviewing witnesses and combing through reports, Dr. Soper received word that another family who lived on Park Avenue had an unexpected outbreak of typhoid fever. The daughter and the maid had both fallen ill, and the daughter unfortunately died soon after. The nurse who who was caring for her then also began showing typhoid symptoms. One food item consistent from infected family to infected family was, unsurprisingly, peach ice cream. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So the raw peaches in the cold ice cream made for the perfect environment for salmonella typhi to thrive. And if you mix in an asymptomatic carrier of that bacteria, you really have a recipe for disaster. Quite literally. (laughs) I know. A peach ice cream recipe <laughs> that sentence for came disaster. To me and I was like, this is so perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Such a nerd. Uh, <laughs> Sober reached out to the family and found out that a cook matching Mary Mallon's description had recently been hired by the family. And it turned out that it was Mary working under an alias. Oh. Yeah. Okay. About 3,000 people in New York had contracted typhoid that year. And I think I mentioned in his quote that Soper accused Mary of being the reason for that outbreak. So he began stalking her and tried to get samples of her urine, feces, and blood, which clearly upset Mary. Yeah. Because she didn't know what was going on, really, and to have somebody trying to get your And, like, how was he trying? Like, was he following her to the bathroom and going in right after or like actively asking her. I don't know. That's definitely weird. 
It sounds like he was more demanding it of her. And For sure. I just feel like Mary doesn't take it from anyone. So Yeah, no, she's a <laughs> hard woman. Yeah. So Dr. Soper, he reached out to the New York Department of Health and he was given permission to bring her in for testing because his methods weren't working. So she apparently was very uncooperative when they picked her up, which sounds more like an arrest than them just trying to collect samples from her. But as you probably suspected, her stool samples were positive for salmonella typhi. Mm Mm-hmm. Because there was no immunization until 1911 and no antibiotic treatment until 1948, authorities figured that the only course of action to keep the public safe was to send Mary to quarantine on North Brother Island, where there was an isolation hospital that was initially created to house smallpox victims. It later expanded to basically imprison those with tuberculosis and typhoid as well. And a little side note, I did find a source that says that it's now legal to visit this island without a permit, which is now a bird sanctuary. Oh, well, that's nice. I mean, I'm glad it's being used for something. I didn't know that she was under an alias. She was using an alias before they even confirmed that she was a carrier. Yeah. So that insinuates guilt to me. Yeah, this is, yeah. She changes her name a few times. And funny thing is she still, I like seemingly, I don't know what all of her aliases were because it wasn't mm-hmm. really described. But in the ones that were named, she still uses her first name and then just changes her last name. So she's oh, still Typhoid Mary. Mary through and through. Till the end. <laughs> yeah. In 1909, Mary tried to sue the New York Health Department for her unlawful confinement. But the suit was unsuccessful since the department claimed her confinement was protecting the general public. And this kind of led to a divide in the community about whether or not she should be incarcerated, um, since many believe it was a violation of her civil rights. Mm-hmm. Sounds familiar. Mm-hmm, right? Current events. Yeah. <laughs> Wee. History repeating itself. <laughs> so she was in the hospital for two years. And I say hospital. It was... Prison. Yeah. It was a prison for people who were sick. Quarantine. Yeah. Um, so she was forced to give... 163 stool samples over those two years, and 120 of them came back positive for typhoid. So she was shedding the infection a lot. Yeah. They tried to remove her gallbladder, which is often where typhoid colonizes in asymptomatic carriers, and she <laughs> rejected that surgery. I feel like she had no trust in the system at this point, and I yeah, don't no. really blame her. No. But it does make me wonder like, if she was ever like properly told or educated on what it means to be a carrier and kind of like what the results of her action actions like could lead to. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like they tried a bunch of treatments on her, but there was really no information on education. Right. But yeah, some of the treatments were things like laxatives and the use of brewer's yeast, which also came up in your part. So everything was unsuccessful there. In 1910, a new health commissioner was named and they promised to free Mary if and only if she would stop working as a cook. She agreed and was released back into the public, except she had lied and continued to work as a cook for unsuspecting employers under another name. So this girl just loved her job. And she probably didn't have any other, like, that was what she did. Mm -hmm. That was what she was known for. She loved her job. I I do feel bad for Mary, even though... She was kind of knowingly spreading a deadly disease. Yeah. Yeah. I know. And I mean, I'll cover this again really shortly, but she's an immigrant woman who's unmarried. Mm -hmm. This was her source of income, her livelihood, and it was all she knew. And it wasn't like she had training in anything else, at least to my knowledge. So months later, Mary Mallon, who was now going by Mary Brown, um, she was discovered again working as a cook at Sloan Maternity Hospital. A hospital. So this is the part that Ooh. I take issue with. Because mm-hmm. not only did she refuse to stop working, but she had kind of plopped herself into a role working with a more vulnerable population. Yeah. And in a matter of weeks, she had spread the infection to at least 25 people, two of whom had died. Hmm. And most of them were like doctors and nurses rather than patients. Hmm. But yeah, still two people died. Yeah. Yeah. 
So Mary was sent back to North Brother Island for violating the terms of her release. And on Christmas in 1932, Mary unfortunately had a stroke, leaving her paralyzed. And six years later, in 1938, she died of pneumonia at age 69 in the hospital. So there is some conflicting information as to whether or not an autopsy was performed. But some sources say that one was done and that she was shedding the bacteria through her gallstones, which made some researchers wonder what would have happened had they removed her gallbladder. Like, would would this shedding and spreading have stopped? Yeah, I wonder. Mm -hmm. But some other researchers, scientists, claim that no autopsy was actually done and that it's an urban legend. So it's kind of unclear as to whether or not that's true. She was then buried at St. Raymond Cemetery in the Bronx, where she remains today. So Dr. Soper, he published his findings on Mary in 1907, so prior to her imprisonment, and later wrote a book on Mary in 1939 titled The Curious Case of Typhoid Mary. His investigation found that she was responsible for spreading typhoid to at least 122 people, resulting in at least five deaths. Hmm. But this begs the question, was Mary a villain menacing the health and well-being of the public, or was she a victim who had her civil liberties stripped away? While this story took place over 100 years ago, as we were saying, this conversation continues today with the onset and spread of COVID-19. And I think we really have to take a look at why Mary's story is one that has been highlighted and criticized for over a century. And I feel like we could start with the fact, again, that she was an immigrant woman. She was part of the working class, and mm-hmm. she was unmarried with no children. And I think that her defiance against societal norms made her out to be more notorious than she actually was. And as I said, nowhere in my research did I come across mm-hmm. any information about efforts to educate Mary on her carrier status. And I can only imagine that she was terrified and just trying to get by. Yeah. Yeah. So education, it's it's so important when it comes to disease transmission, public health and safety. And I feel like misinformation or a lack of understanding can really be deadly. And I feel like Typhoid Mary is the perfect example. Absolutely she is. I wonder too, like, did she did they did they know that washing your hands as a cook would probably be enough to prevent the spread of typhoid fever? And maybe wearing a mask and a hairnet and just like taking those kind of hygienic precautions, they could have educated her on that and she could have continued working. Germ theory was just starting to pick up during this time because before Mm -hmm. it was called, or what I found it was called was filth theory. Yeah. And then there was obviously the airborne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, Miasma. As well. Um, So I feel like even if you take miasma and filth theory it doesn't really necessarily correlate to washing your hands. It wasn't until germ theory came more into play Mm -hmm. that that became like an obvious thing to do. For sure. But I think like she was clearly being closely studied. Mm -hmm. They could have done experiments. Mm -hmm. Like she was isolated. Like could they probably could have done experiments where they had her wash her hands, had her make peach ice cream, and then tested it for the bacteria. (laughs) Who's going to eat that, though? (laughs) No, just test for the bacteria. Like, they can test feces for the bacteria. That's true. You know what I mean? Also, you're right. Like, you're so right about her, like, her social power as an immigrant woman. She was a working, you know, the working class. She wasn't married. Women Mm -hmm. had very limited rights at this time. Mm -hmm. Like, she probably also didn't have a strong science education. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like... I feel for her. I feel like she was just trying to make it and just like, leave me alone. I'm not sick. I don't have symptoms. Yeah. I am conflict. Like, yes, all of those points. But then the part that I'm conflicted by is why she would change her name when Mm -hmm. she moved from home to home. She would leave homes right after there was a typhoid outbreak. Yeah. Because I think she knew that she was the one that caused it. I bet she thought she was bad luck. I bet she thought she was cursed. Like, she was probably just rationalizing, like, like what it, what curse? Like, what did I do to deserve this? Every house I go to gets typhoid. But I bet she didn't fully comprehend the fact that she was, like, harboring a bunch of bacteria for this disease and not getting sick herself. Yeah. I know. It's so sad. It'd be a lot to wrap your mind around. It would be. 
And then really also, like, I'm sure she didn't have a ton of savings in the bank. She's got to work. This is mm-hmm. her skill. Yeah. Yeah, I feel for her. I do, too. Yeah. I mean, that's the end of the story. Amazing story. It always, <laughs> it's such a good story. It's so good. I feel like I could listen to that when I fall asleep at night. Like, I, like not because it's boring, but just because it's, like, a comforting, <laughs> historical, like, <laughs> great well, story. I love it. Lucky for you, we're recording this episode, <laughs> and you can fall asleep to this every night. <laughs> oh, night, night, can't Sarah. Wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was so good. Oh, thank you. I guess before, before I ask you if you have a question for me, mm-hmm. I just wanted to say that in my research, I found at like a BBC article from 2017 mm-hmm. that said that a mini series is being created on Mary Mallon. Oh my gosh! And it's supposed to star Elizabeth Moss. I'm in. I'm right? so in. That's amazing. Yeah, I know. I just got shivers even just repeating yeah. that. But she is incredible. She's an incredible actress, and I feel uh-huh. like I could so see her playing this character. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that's good. I'm excited. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> okay. For next episode. Yes. Describe your perfect burger. Okay. Okay. <laughs> uh, I feel like Not this a is going to be an a demand. unpopular. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is going to be an unpopular answer. Uh-huh. A veggie burger. <laughs> Lame. Uh, okay. <laughs> I know it's lame, but I don't really eat beef anymore. So yeah. I love a veggie burger. There's mm-hmm. this one that they have at South Street. Burger. Okay. I don't know if you've ever yeah. been there. Yeah. Um, but I think it's owned by the same people that uh, made New York fries. Mm-hmm. So you get the burger and the fries are also fantastic. But the burger, I always get like all of the toppings, like all of the lettuce, onions, tomato, Maybe not tomato. Pickle? Pickles. Like all, yeah. yeah, pickles for sure. Yeah. But I take my pickles off and eat them separately. Okay. Um, okay. And then like all of the sauces and then guacamole. So good. Nice. Okay. Okay. That sounds great. Yeah. How about you? <laughs> Mine would be more like burger burger with like aged white cheddar. Beefy. Thick bacon. Yeah, it'd be beef. It would definitely have a pickle on it because you need like that tart crunch, that mm-hmm. tang. To offset all the grease. Um, yeah, it would be, I'm hungry. I'm like salivating right now. <laughs> it's so funny. I forgot what episode we're doing next. And yeah, this do you know just what it is now? Me. Now I oh, do. You know. yeah. Okay. Because <laughs> we talked about it, but um, ages ago. Ages ago. Mm-hmm. I'm excited. It's going to mm-hmm. be a really good one. It's going to be beefy. <laughs> <laughs> Gross. <laughs> all right. See you next episode. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Unsavory. You can find all the references and materials used to put this episode together in our show notes at unsavorypodcast.com. This is an independently produced podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, we would love it if you would rate, review, follow, and share our show with your true crime and food-loving friends. If you'd like to donate to the podcast, you can sign up as a donor through our Patreon link in our bio. To keep up to date with the podcast, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Unsavory Podcast. If you have an idea for an episode or segment, email us at unsavorypod at gmail.com. This podcast was recorded and edited by Earworm Radio. We highly recommend their services for all of your podcasting needs. You can learn more about them at earwormradio.com. <laughs>